we didn't shift down to fourth gear at all. We stayed in overdrive. We stayed in fifth the whole time. So what I realized is that as we powered through year one and then powered through year two and just stayed really focused on our members and everything they needed, I could see my team getting tired. And so I realized that we had to make big changes and do big things in order to avoid a massive turnover issue or massive burnout issue. This is Associations Thrive, the podcast celebrating successful associations and their leaders. I'm your host, Joanna Pineda, CEO and Chief Troublemaker at Matrix Group International. Listen in as top association executives tell all, revealing the creative and innovative ways they're increasing membership, generating revenue, nurturing engagement, and reimagining their organizations. By the way, if you've launched a new initiative, created new member services, or updated your governance structure and are seeing great results, I want to hear your story and so do my listeners. I'd love to have you as a guest. Go to podcast.matrixgroup.net and apply to be on Associations Thrive. Now let's dive into this week's show. Today, I'm speaking with Christina Llewellyn, Executive Director of the Association of Technology Leaders in Independent Schools, or ATLAS. Christina, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm a big fan. Well, thanks so much. Hey, Christina, tell us about ATLAS. You're a fairly new association, and you're killing it. (laughs) Thank you. Yes, we are fairly young. We're about eight years old, and we started because the technology teams and CIOs who work at independent schools were getting together at other industry events. So if another association was hosting a big event, there would be this kind of all call for the technology people to get together informally. And eventually our three founders got together and said, you know, there really needs to be a networking and professional development home for the technology teams at independent schools. So they formed Atlas. And they hosted their first event in 2015, and it was a smashing success immediately. And so the community came together and coalesced very, very fast. And from there, we've kind of expanded beyond just an event into a fully formed association with the staff and lots of programming and lots of networking opportunities and professional development, kind of career advancement type opportunities. So it continues to grow really fast. And I think it's a much needed home. When our people get together for annual conference, they are excited to be together. Hey, Christina, for my listeners who don't know what an independent school is, maybe you can tell us what that is. It basically refers to, first of all, not public, but also not necessarily affiliated, for example, with a religious organization or any kind of other grouping. Independent schools are truly independent. So they're private schools, but we often refer to them as independent schools. Many of them are collegiate prep schools. We do have some Jewish day schools and some Episcopal schools, for example. So it's not that we are exclusively independent only, but these are schools that consider themselves independent from a larger organization kind of dictating their mission and how they deliver education. Christina, my son goes to an independent school that happens to be Episcopal, and I know they have an IT director, and I can imagine that it gets to be a little lonely being an IT director at a K-12 school. And I imagine that's why Atlas is so valuable. I think you're right. I think that it's not only that it's lonely, but it is a very unique job because we sort of look at our technology leaders. I use that phrase broadly because it could be a tech director, IT director, it could be a CIO. So there's lots of different titles in there. But broadly, the technology leaders at these schools, sometimes they are the Lone Ranger structure. Sometimes they have a team, but their team is kind of like sitting in the back of the library or the basement set of offices. But they have a tough job because they're not only delivering technology for the classroom. So what we kind of think of as tech for education or tech for our learners, but also technology for the operations, running the business Uh, of a school. Yeah, That requires a lot of technology also. 
Then there's this other aspect of leadership where they're actually leading a team and sometimes having a seat at the big table when decisions are made. So they need to understand the broader dynamics and politics of what goes on at an independent school. So technology leaders, they are a unique breed because they really have to have both the IT expertise to keep their students and faculty safe, to keep their communities safe. They need to have ed tech experience to know best practices for delivering a contemporary education. And they also need to be really great business leaders and teammates and staff leaders. And so they are really unique humans that are very impressive to watch. I love the dynamic of our membership. Boy, that's amazing. Christina, before we dive into the things that are helping Atlas thrive, let's talk about your journey to becoming executive director. And this is your first CEO position. It is. And it was a goal of mine that I set about 10 years ago. I never envisioned myself in this place, but basically I started in journalism. When I first came out of college, I worked for newspapers and I did a brief stint in television, but I loved writing and I loved kind of investigative deep dive reporting. I landed at an association. I was in the D.C. area when my husband and I were starting our life together, and I landed at an association that owned a trade publication. And so I fell into this place where I was covering a specific industry and its issues, and I love that there were just so many layers of the onion to peel back. At first, I thought, you know, it's Window and Door Magazine. It was It's owned by the National Glass Association. And I thought at first, like, how boring must this be? And I immediately found it is not. We are helping these folks. There's a mission to it. We're helping them do their jobs better. We're helping them run their plants better. We're helping them run their businesses better. And so I loved and I immediately connected with the bigger mission beyond just the delivery of a magazine. So I stayed in that space for a long time. And eventually I went back to school. I got an MBA from the Rochester Institute of Technology. And once I did that and had the business background, I started moving into leadership positions, either communications, marketing, membership. At associations as well? Yeah, all at associations. I temporarily did a stint back in corporate after I got my MBA, but I missed the mission. I love running a business. I love making money. I love being efficient, but I like doing it for an industry. And I was missing that when I worked for a family or a private company or a person. So I came back to associations with this more focused and refined goal for myself that I would stay in associations. This is my home. I love running a really tight, efficient, contemporary business within the confines of an association serving an industry. And so I came back and then I stayed in the VP roles for a while, both in marketing, membership, communications, but also in business development and operations. And then eventually I started venturing out and looking for my first CEO job. And how long have you been at Atlas? I have finished my third year. So I guess I'm in year four. I started in 2019. So I had about six months of normal until the pandemic hit, maybe about eight months of normal. Wow. And then kind of went into this instant tailspin like many people did. Well, so let's talk about Atlas. During our conversation before we started recording, you gave me an incredible statistic. You said that membership is growing and growing fast, like 35% year over year. Yeah. Holy smokes. And your staff is growing as well. So first of all, congratulations. Thank you. It's been fun. It's been a fun ride. And I love that you're a new CEO and you're getting to really spread your wings and make your mark. So let's talk about the things that are helping you thrive. You said that the number one thing is governance. How is that possible that governance is helping you thrive and grow? Well, I think that Atlas is unique in that we're young enough that we just finished our first year without a founder on our board, Ah. right? The three founders came in, they started it, and then they brought in their first crop of board members to serve with them and help flesh all of this out. And so fast forward a few years when I came in, 
And they were really looking to professionalize the association. They had taken this beautiful piece of clay and molded it the best they could for as long as they could. But it was really time to get professional management in with an experienced background in association management. And so to their credit, not only did they bring me in with a clear goal to have Atlas become the more professional, mature version of itself, but they also had a plan for offloading, like offboarding themselves. And that's amazing. So you had the three founders who basically said, we're going to found this and then we're going to leave the board. And that doesn't happen all the time. Sometimes they hang on and they want to continue to be involved and they're letting you run this. Yeah, I'm so lucky because at first one founder, Gabe Lucas, he cycled off and his parting gift to Atlas was that he spent about a year cleaning up our bylaws and creating a transition chart because, you know, when they brought these new board members on to serve with them, there was no game plan for when these board members would be done. Ah. There were no terms. It wasn't really defined. And so Gabe first gave us this beautiful gift of making sure that the bylaws and governance was in a good place. And he departed. And then the following year, our other two founders, Kelsey Bruman and Stuart Posen, they each brought their gift. One was Kelsey has an incredible background in strategic planning and strategy. So she worked for about a year on setting up Atlas with a really brilliant, very all-encompassing strategic plan. And Stuart, who has a really strong background in finances, was like, okay, now let's make sure that our financial situation is moving toward our first audit, external audit, which came fast, right? Wow. So we needed to make sure that those things were in place. Once they got those pieces in place, they left. And so this was our first full year with no founders. But they left you an organization in good shape. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And they're still available. They're still involved. They're in the membership. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. If I need them, you know, recently we were having a conversation about whether our 10th anniversary should be celebrated in 2024 when the paperwork was done or 2025 when the first event was held. And so I reached out to them and within hours they were kicking back ideas. And then we shared those ideas with the full board and the full board was like, well, if the founders like this idea, then so do we. So they still are like these advisors at a distance. They do not insert themselves unless I reach out to them. It's a blessing. It's a very unique blessing that I don't think many CEOs get to experience, but to be that closely connected with the people who set this sucker up in the beginning is really cool. So you say that you've got an equal and healthy relationship with your board. What do you mean by that? I think that we have been very intentional about our governance for the last few years because of the founders leaving. You know, if you think about that, that creates a vacuum of leadership where if they were going to leave, it could have all just fallen apart. But I think that the remaining board members, especially some of those original board members that were finishing out their terms, were really committed to making sure that this stayed strong, in fact, got stronger, and also was just really healthy. And so we invested in a lot of governance coaching. Mm -hmm. We still have a consultant who coaches our board, kind of advises us, okay, you check the box. Now let's push it to the next level. Let's talk about this. You've got a coach for the board. Yes. How does that work? Who is he or she and what do they do? (laughs) It's Lowell Applebaum, which many people rely on. He's got such a gentle touch. Yes. Okay. Lowell comes to our annual retreat, at least he has for the last few years, and he will kind of take stock of where we are and what we did from the last time he was with us. And then he gives us our marching orders for the next year. He facilitates this lovely conversation of, okay, let's peel back that onion one more layer. What do we want to tackle next? And so then the board walks away for the year with a game plan of we really need to go back to our committee this year, our committee charters and charges and be very clear so that there's not confusion about who's doing what. So it's just like we constantly dig deeper into the details so that we run more efficiently. And so having an outsider come in and coach us and focus our energy on the things that matter and have us articulate our values and the way that we operate with each other is really valuable. Now, you also say that the board has been really great about questioning everything. How do they do that? When do they do that? You know, is that exhausting? Is it exhilarating? It's within their swim lane. So they question everything, but not operationally. 
They stay out of that. And instead, they're excited. I've turned them into a bunch of governance geeks. Like they're excited about things like, why do we need to meet monthly as a finance committee? Mm. You know, we're not like we were before. We have independent auditors. We have outside accountants. Christina reports to us on our board portal every month. So why are we meeting monthly? So they're challenging things like that. Or we have a July 1st start date with our new fiscal year. So why do we need a budget in place before the fiscal year? Because the sooner we put the budget in place, it may check a box and make us lower anxiety, make us feel better. But it's not as accurate as if we were to maybe set up a preliminary budget and then approve a final budget once we went through renewals in September. Ah, Because then you really know where you are financially after the renewals come in. Absolutely. So I love that they are challenging, not that we're old enough to have the way we've always done it, but they also are really challenging the why. Why do we need to do it this way? Is there a more efficient way to do it? And finally, I will say that I give them a lot of credit because coming from the independent school space, independent schools are often run by a board of trustees. As you know, your son goes to one. Yes. And then the head of school reports to that board. So when people come to the Atlas board for service, they anticipate that it will run like an independent school board. But we are not a school. We are an association. So to their credit, they've also challenged themselves. They also police themselves that when they start getting a little too independent school-like, they will stop and they will call timeout and they'll say, actually, we're an association and so we don't need to worry about X, Y, or Z. Or we can make different decisions than a school because of these other unique dynamics of Atlas. So they challenge themselves to stay real focused on what Atlas needs and how we can best serve our community. Oh my God, Christina, anybody listening to this podcast is going to be really jealous. (laughs) I would be too. I feel very fortunate. I recognize that I'm in a position with a board that it's very special. It's very healthy. I recognize I may never get it again. Like I can see where I sit right now that the grass may never be greener. I'm very fortunate and I'm just loving this ride. I plan to go nowhere for the foreseeable future. You are selling yourself short. You have a lot to do with why this board relationship is so healthy. Hey, let's talk about Another thing that you say is really helping you to thrive, and that is your internal culture and kind of operationally how you run Atlas. So you call it a contemporary workplace. And some of this you started before the pandemic, and then the pandemic kind of forced the issue. So what is Atlas like as a workplace? The reason I call it contemporary is because I feel like we're adjusting to what the workplace is telling us, what the environment is telling us, rather than resisting it. I definitely came to this role with a certain expectation of myself, because I had always said, if I'm in a position to make these decisions, I will do better. Mm. I struggled, you know, with a young family and as a female executive, carrying a lot of weight on the shoulders kind of thing. And I said, you know, this could be easier. It doesn't have to be this way. And so I said, you know what, I cannot influence or affect it now, but if I'm in charge, I will do my best to lay an easier path because I think we can still serve our members in a really efficient and effective way without these shackles of how it used to be done. And so I came in with that kind of open-mindedness, and I think that has served me well. We were always decentralized because we're a relatively young organization. So you're all remote. Yeah. I mean, Atlas has an office and sometimes Another one of our staffers who's local will come in and be with me here, but everyone else is remote. That's great, right? We can have wonderful employees anywhere, but even more so, we definitely didn't have to adjust to working in a remote environment when the world shut down, but we were in the midst of transitioning our event. We had 28 days notice, so we were one of the first organizations to go virtual. And we had to figure that out very quickly. We were finishing finishing touches on our event in Chicago and suddenly that wasn't going to happen. We had to power into that. So I was grateful that we had a system for paying bills and taking care of payroll and receiving the mail. I didn't have to figure any of that out because that was already in place. But what I did realize is that we had a different issue is that nobody got to go home and bake bread. 
Nobody got to go pick up knitting or take a time out from the commute because we were already virtual. So my team never slowed down. We didn't shift down to fourth gear at all. We stayed in overdrive. We stayed in fifth the whole time. So what I realized is that as we powered through year one and then powered through year two and just stayed really focused on our members and everything they needed, I could see my team getting tired. Mm -hmm. And so I realized that we had to make big changes and do big things in order to avoid a massive turnover issue or massive burnout issue. What are some of the things you've done? We have moved to a four-day work week. Whoa. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Any four days or specific four days? We close Friday. Okay. Everybody's off. And actually, that's a good question because early in the pandemic, I realized that if one of us took a day off, but the rest of us stayed working, that really wasn't a day off. That person had to come back and do twice the work when he, she, they got back in. So that taught me an important lesson. When I was considering a four-day work week, we knew that we all needed to be off in order for it to fully refresh the team. And a lot of criticism of that will be, well, how do you serve your members? Well, I think we are lucky because our members are very technical and high tech. And so they don't call us anyway. (laughs) They want to email or direct message us, but they do not call us. But I also think that we've created an environment where we still can get back to them. We can stay connected, but still have the day off and be at the zoo with our family. So we use technology and leverage technology. So our members are never waiting. Their experience has not suffered. But the result is that my team gets this time out where they come back truly refreshed and ready to tackle a new week on Monday. So it's been incredible. The productivity has really been incredible. We also picked up a policy My lawyer advises me not to call it unlimited time off, but it is flexible time off. There are still limits around if they needed a long-term leave, like a childcare leave or something to that effect, but they can take off as much time as they want. They do. So we don't have limits on vacation. I don't have to track it anymore. It's basically unlimited. If they need a day off, they take a day off. They give me a heads up and they are taking the time off because we've created a culture that celebrates taking time off. So those are just a couple things I think that are changes, but they weren't just as easy as throwing a policy into a Word document and hitting save. It needed leadership adjustments. Like it took me a while. The four-day work week thing we piloted for a bit through the summer. And then I extended the pilot through the end of the year. And then I felt comfortable enough to say, okay, yeah, let's go ahead and make this permanent. But it took some changes and me challenging myself and my leadership style to really not care when they work and just focus on the deliverables and focus on the projects getting done. When you're focused on the deliverables and the results, I guess it doesn't matter when they're working as long as they're achieving their goals. And so what's been the result of having this contemporary workplace? Yeah, that's absolutely true. And I think a lot of people will say that. I don't care when they work, but they don't necessarily feel that. And I even said it. I would say, oh, I'm cool. You can work whenever. I'm flexible. Just get your stuff done. But I had to adjust a little bit to making sure I still felt comfortable that we were doing the best job we could for our members. So we turned to technology to help us manage that. We use project management software. We stay in close contact with each other. I think what the result is, that we spend more of our time together during staff meetings talking not about individual projects or progress, but we talk about how we can improve our work environment, how we can communicate better, how we can set up a sauna better, how we can use Slack better. And so we use our time together to make the system more efficient rather than just rehashing what has already been communicated somewhere else. And I think that it has gone a long way. The team loves it. Our retention, obviously, I don't think I'll be losing anybody anytime soon. The recruitment piece of things, I think I could probably attract just about any association person who's not loving their work environment. Every time I talk about my four-day work week, the first reaction is, are you hiring? (laughs) So I think that that says something. It'd be real easy for me to steal great employees from other organizations, but I do not think the same could be said in reverse. Well, you know what? It strikes me as amazing about this is you've got an organization that has good governance, that has membership that's growing, that is run in a modern progressive way with a close staff. So I guess that's not surprising that you're just killing it for your members. Wow. Congratulations for that leadership. Thank you. 
And the team is excited to serve our members. That's the goal. Give them enough room. And I bet the members can feel it, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I can feel your enthusiasm for the membership, and I'm sure the members feel it from the staff. So they're like, you know, why not be part of this community? Yeah, absolutely. And that's not to say that we're not demanding. And we work hard, and we do tons of lift for a small staff. So I think that the demands on the team did not change. Like, we're still pedaling really fast. But in allowing them a true mental break, a true focus on their personal lives so that when they come to us for Atlas time, it can be very, very focused on Atlas. It's pretty incredible. It really does make a very big difference. Wow. Hey, let's talk a little bit about some of the Atlas services. So during the pandemic, I think a lot of my clients felt like they had to be very, very present for their members they became kind of these havens for their members to talk about what was happening to get guidance. I think you were the same, but you probably had extra demands because IT became the savior or the downfall of organizations. So I think you talk about how you had to be nimble to create programs that responded to the current environment. So talk to us about these ad hoc programs and ad hoc communities, because that's amazing. You got to act fast. Yeah. Yeah. We do. And I think that's what's so cool about the way that we work at Atlas is that we're very structured. So we've got our project management software and we're going to accomplish X, Y, and Z in a given week, or we have certain deadlines that we really try to stick to. But then something like chat GPT comes up, which is an artificial intelligence tool where a kid can go in and say, write me a term paper on X, Y, or Z, and it spits out a term paper. And what's crazy about it is that traditional plagiarism softwares are not catching this content that's being designed by AI. Oh, my God. And so schools needed to, like, there was some media attention about this recently. And so we kind of dropped whatever deliverables, like hit pause, go over here, let's have a forum on AI. I think it was a record-breaking webinar. Like, my team had to add more access to our platforms because we didn't have enough seats for the number of people who wanted to show. And I think that goes to show what's cool about Atlas is that We're not just serving our member schools, we're serving the broader education community. So regardless of whether your school is a member, we're going to host these conversations and a whole bunch of people come out of the woodwork and receive the benefits of being a part of this broader Atlas community, even if they're not members. And so we have the flexibility to sort of set aside what was on the agenda or, oh, we've already done the March webinar or we've already done the December webinar. Uh Uh-uh. If we need to have a conversation about AI right now, we will do it. And so we did that. And from that, we crowdsource solutions. We crowdsource ideas. We spit it back out to the community. So I think that the energy that a lot of folks had during the pandemic to be that responsive, we hung on to that, embraced it, and made it a permanent part of the fabric of Atlas. So we will always hear what our members are saying. If there's a little rumbling going on on our discussion boards, we don't just like check the box and move on. My team is that active and involved that they will say, Christina, we didn't have a plan, but next Thursday, we really need to host a big old conversation about this. And of course, I'm going to do that. So we stay really responsive to bringing the community together so that they can solution together. And that's been incredibly powerful for Atlas. And I bet that's why you have an amazing retention rate. And that's why you're growing because you've got nimble governance, you've got a crazy committed staff, and you're able to really respond to whatever is happening in the tech landscape, which is already crazy enough. You sort of make it sound easy, actually, in that summary. I'm sure it's incredibly difficult, but I'm sure having an amazing staff and supportive board really makes it amazing. And with you at the helm, I'm not surprised. Christina, I could talk to you all day, but I know that my time is running out. So I want to say thank you for sharing what you're doing to thrive at Atlas and for sharing your wisdom. And I hope that you'll come back. It's been my pleasure. I love this podcast. Please keep doing it. You keep me company when I'm on drives and killing time. So you're doing great. You are so sweet. And listeners, it turns out she's not too far from me. So Christina, we're going to have to have lunch and let's have lunch with Lindsay. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. Thanks for listening to Associations Thrive. 
We're so glad to have you here. You know, my personal mission and the mission of my company, Matrix Group International, is to help associations and nonprofits increase membership, generate revenue, and thrive in the digital space. I want to hear stories of how your organization is thriving in today's challenging landscape. Please apply to be on my show by going to podcast.matrixgroup.net. By the way, do you need help with a digital initiative? Maybe it's a website redesign, a new membership database, or a hybrid meeting that you're planning. I'd love to connect with you. Please visit the Matrix Group website at matrixgroup.net. Thanks again for listening to this week's episode of Associations Thrive. Don't forget to subscribe to the show, leave a five-star rating, post a comment, and share it with your colleagues and friends. Bye.